So um, Tristan and Valerie, you guys are willing to help me out with monitoring the, um, the chat and whatnot? Yes, yeah, of course. course. Of okay. course. I can't yeah. seem to find the button now that I'm in screen share to open the chat. Yeah, it's, I mean, in oh, my, in my it. Zoom, it's, in it's on top. Okay. Yeah, it's in the more menu, but it didn't show up anywhere. I don't even know, man. It's cool. We got it. Cool. Um, with how quiet the group is, we'll see. I asked, I mean, I'm planning for some interaction, everybody, so, you know. Pra you know, start practicing your vocal exercises or whatever you need to speak up. Uh, <laughs> I figured the chat that is a good backup. Okay, I guess we can start, Greg. All right, cool. Um, all right, hi everybody. Hope you're doing well. Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking to you all today about testing and continuous integration, or CI, as I put it in the title here. Um, so uh, basically, oops, there we go. Um, the outline is pretty much as follows. I'm going to do a bit of an introduction on what is testing, what are some different types of testing, why do we do them. Um, same thing with continuous integration. And then we're just going to start practicing. So I basically created like the stub of a project. Um, and I haven't set up testing or continuous integration for it. And we are going to do that together. And uh, I, again, deliberately have not prepared it so that you can see which parts of this, you know, I remember and which parts I don't. And one thing that you'll quickly find is that the important thing to remember is more the process. You don't need to memorize, you know, all the syntax for all the little libraries, all that kind of stuff. It's very easy to find answers to all those when you need them. Um, so this is more about the concepts of testing and continuous integration rather than any particular tool. Um, I happen to, you know, be using whatever libraries and platforms I'm using, but that's deliberately not the point. Um, cool. So let's start with uh, testing. So can people in the chat or un unmute yourselves um, give me some ideas as to what the purpose of testing is? If you just had to guess based on, you know, the name of it. Feel free to unmute yourselves. Otherwise, just comment in the chat. I'll give you guys a few seconds to do so, depending which one you're doing. But please don't leave me hanging, guys. Um, can you hear me? Yep, perfectly. So, I guess to validate if what you wanted to work is working, something like this? Yep, absolutely, to validate exactly what you want to work, what you want to see working. For sure. Um, and I mean, that can be broad, right? That can be, uh, you know, saying I want my entire end to end pipeline from, you know, data acquisition and pre processing all the way to my statistical analysis to be working, or that can be any of, you know, the little pieces all along the way. And working is also, you know, kind of ill defined. Um, so, you know, it can mean that our tool doesn't crash. We um, have other, we, sorry, Greg, we have oh, other answers yeah. in the chat. Oh, please. Yeah, uh, let me know. I can't see it. Make sure there's no bug. Yeah. Finding errors. Yep. And learning. Absolutely. It's mighty. Those are all great. I particularly like the learning one. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are all great reasons. And there's tons of them. So I just jotted down a few. So yes, identifying bugs is one. Um, you know, once you patch your bugs, testing the effectiveness of those bug fixes. Um, you know, verifying that your tool doesn't crash because, you know, working can mean that your tool simply runs end to end. That seems like the lowest bar for working. Um, but then, you know, beyond that is they can make sure that the outputs and inputs, while it didn't crash, they're being produced and they are the right thing. So, for instance, say your pipeline was supposed to pre-process a, you know, a structural MRI and at the end of it, you were just given an empty image. Well, that's not, you know, you have a different test to write than just if the tool crashed versus if it's giving you like an actual, you know, three dimensional image or something. Um, you know, makes it, make sure it handles corner cases. So that means, you know, situations where that are known to cause exceptions. Um, and, uh, you know, some, doing some quality assurance as everyone does in their pipelines, evaluating performance. What I mean by performance is kind of like the resource requirement. So how much, you know, um, memory and CPU uh, demand that the pipeline or tool is putting on your computer and so on. So there's a lot of good reasons to test, um, but it's really, yeah, to learn 
about your tool um, and to, to try and understand it. So here are a bunch of different types of testing. Um, really there's, I just got this list from some Google search, but I feel like it's pretty descriptive. Um, there's, so again, two broad categories you can think of uh, in terms of testing. We have functional testing, which is testing, you know, the function of our, of our pipeline or our tool. And there's non-functional testing, which is more testing things that are around it. So this is again, like where I said, um, like resource requirements and things like that. This is more in the non-functional category because it's not testing that your tool is doing the right thing. It's simply testing what is the demand imposed by this tool. Um, so in terms of, you know, all these, there's a few that I've highlighted that we're going to be um, working with in particular and looking at. Um, so we're going to be talking about unit testing, integration testing, regression testing in terms of the functional types. And then for the non-functionals, we'll be doing install testing and then stress testing. Um, performance, load, stress, they're all kind of interchangeably used. Um, Greg, yep. uh, Ella, Ella commented in the chat saying to make sure that the program act actually does what we, what we expect it to do. I think this is kind of important. Yeah, absolutely. So, right. So making sure the tool does what we're expecting to do is kind of, I'd probably put that in. Oh, I can't, oh, let's see if I can turn on the pointer. I never had, know how to work these things. Um, I would kind of put that in, you know, a bunch of these kind of span that topic. So like inputs and outputs are in the expected form. The data is, you know, the right quality. It's not just like dumping out an empty image, but we're dumping out, you know, if we have a tool, say we're writing a tool that does skull stripping for a brain, um, we wouldn't want the output to just be the skull. We'd want the output to be the brain. So it's things like there's a bunch of different types of tests you can, you can make. And again, depending on the, on what you're evaluating, it can be easier or harder to write those. Um, but yeah, that's exactly right. It's to try and make sure that your test, your tool is doing what you want. Um, and so there's different ways in which uh, we can look at this. So I'm just gonna give a bit of an explanation for each of these. Um, so unit testing is kind of the most basic building block of, um, of testing. You have a single component, you have a single say function, and you're just testing that it performs as expected. Um, you know, you've given, say, a, a function that again takes a number and it's supposed to just square it. You pass in a number, you get the output, you verify that it is what you expect it to be. Um, integration testing is when you essentially combine um, different units together and verify that they're not only both functioning as their independent units, but, uh, but they function in the integration. Um, there's this great, uh, there's this great GIF that um, I, I now I wish I pulled it up ahead of time um, that some of you may have seen. There's this picture that uh, it's on the it was on Twitter like a year ago and it was going around where basically it was um, you know the hand dryers in uh, in bathrooms it was one of those placed directly above a trash bin and it said unit tests both passed integration tests failed because what was happening is when the blow dryer was on it was knocking it was blowing everything out of the garbage bin. So, you know, independently, the garbage bin functioned. It contained all of the things. The hair dryer functioned, or hand dryer functioned. It was blowing air. But when you put them together in that arrangement, it did not give you what you wanted. It was throwing garbage around the bathroom. Um, so that's really what integration testing is. It's using independent components um, and putting them together and verifying that the result is actually what you want as well. Um, regression testing is then pretty much integration testing, but when you make a change, you are evaluating essentially the impact of that change um, on your pipeline and on your, on your performance. Does anyone have any questions about uh, the three kind of types of uh, functional testing I've highlighted here? So maybe how, where would you put let, the, the testing of a complete pipeline? Let's say to take brain masking, for instance, um, I'm writing a pipeline that's supposed to be brain masking. I want, you know, I have a few images to test on as right. part of my test suites. Would it be integration testing or unit testing? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so again, I think this is a matter of uh, resolution, what resolution you're looking at. So if you are simply, imagine you were the developer of FSL and you wrote BET, which is their extraction tool. Um, you would probably have many independent individual components that go into BET and you would want to do a unit test on each of those components. Um, 
and then the integration test would be the entire BET pipeline. However, if what you're doing is you're taking BET for granted and you are doing other things around it and maybe adding a step before, a step after, maybe in this case, in this context, BET is a single unit for you and other steps are also single units, in which case your entire little pipeline is the integration. Um, so I think whether something is a unit test or an integration test is really a matter of resolution. Um, if you are, what the way I'd almost describe it is a unit test should be um, performing a single, you know, unique function. Um, each unit should be rather um, that you have, you know, the ability to change independently. So, for instance, again, if I wasn't an FSL developer, I would still probably put I would put the you know um, BET as one unit in my little sub pipeline because if it's not working properly, I can either tweak the parameters or I can use a different tool for that step or so on. Um, but, uh, but that's really what I think is it, as, some, as close as you can get to an atomic function per component is what you would call a unit in this testing framework. Cool. Yeah, thanks. We have uh, another question in the chat from Nadia. Could you yeah. possibly give an example of regression testing to better differentiate it from integration testing? Absolutely. When you write a program, why do you need to make sure that the program resists the modification of itself? if modifying itself isn't its original function. Okay, so imagine you have this pipeline. I think I understood that. Um, if you, imagine you have a pipeline that is say, generating um, uh, structural or functional connectivity matrices, doesn't really matter. Let's say the, the last step of your pipeline, you were doing some thresholding. And, or sorry, maybe the second last, you're doing some thresholding. And then the last step is computing statistics on the resulting um, connectomes. If you say tweak the threshold you're using, you will certainly be affecting things downstream from that. And how is not necessarily obvious unless you do something like a regression test. Because um, again, so a regression test isn't necessarily I added this new component um, and compare it to the previous iteration that didn't have that component. It's more like I changed something and I'm comparing apples to apples. I'm comparing you know, the statistics on my connectomes to the statistics on my connectomes with something different in the middle that you know, a consumer or a user of my tool wouldn't necessarily notice. Um, does that make sense? Uh, Tristan, you're muted at the moment, or at least I, I can't hear you. Uh, she yes. says, uh, oh, so it has to be resistance to like parameter tuning. And then, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I mean, it depends what the goal is. I, I'm not, I wouldn't necessarily even use the word resistant um, because sometimes, you know, you want a change. That's why you made it. Um, it's simply understanding what that change, or the impact of that change. So again, the, their goal isn't always for it to have the outputs of like a regression test to be no difference. Again, in fact, that's often not the goal. It's just to understand what those changes were and the impact of each of these kind of um, modifications have on that. So again, this could be to hyperparameters. This could be to swapping one registration algorithm for another one. Um, this could be doing all sorts of things like that. But the, the point is really that you are comparing apples to apples. You are comparing the same things at the end of the pipeline um, that again, your users would want to be comparing themselves. Does that make sense? Nadia said yes, thanks. So I guess it does. Perfect. Maybe an example at a lower level. Uh, imagine you have, I don't know, two features, three features, existing features in your pipeline, and one of them reads a number from the standard output. Okay, maybe it would just, you know, read the volume of a brain region from the console. And then you add a verbose option to your pipeline, dash dash verbose, so that it prints more information, you know, and more messages to help people debug and understand what's going on. If you don't test, it's well possible that that feature that read from the standard output would be just broken by your addition of verbos. And you wouldn't even realize that until, you know, you would try the feature again and see, oh no, now it's not parsing a number from the STD out, it's parsing, you know, whatever information string. So, yeah, it's a great example. Yeah. And I think it's important. It importantly illustrates that um, you know the uh, the changes don't have to be meaningful, like deliberately meaningful changes in your pipeline, and exactly. it's impossible to know whether or not they will be without testing. Um, because right, little things like adding a verbose option um, that changes the alignment of text, um, or like if, for instance, you're saving a data frame and you um, 
basically say like index equals false and where before it was true. So you're no longer printing the index column. Well, then if you have another thing that's reading a CSV file manually, maybe um, you will be grabbing from the wrong column than you were before because there's one fewer columns in, in the table. So there's a bunch of things like that, that is just, you know, there's a lot of moving parts when you start building multi-step pipelines and processing tools and things like that. Um, and really the only way to know which pieces impact other pieces is by testing every combination that you can think of and always um, doing things like regression tests, which is again, where continuous integration comes in and I'll get to a little bit later. Isabel is saying to just think of a software update. Yeah. Um, has like, this is an, an example too, right? Mm -hmm. And I think of course. Yeah, software updates, ex exactly. from a different version of a library. Um, that's exactly what's happening. They will have done, hopefully, uh, regression tests and say, well, you know, this feature no longer works as expected. You know, this will give a slightly different output, so on and so forth. And hopefully these are well described in like a release notes type thing where it says, you know, our latest version now with whatever. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this is, it's exactly for the purpose of versioning. Um, and again, as a scientific consumer, this is particularly important. You know, if it's for like a plotting library, you know, who really cares? We'll switch to the new syntax, we'll, you know, update and accommodate and follow along. But from a scientific perspective, if, you know, we're processing our data a certain way, and let's say we came to a, you know, positive result, um, meaning like, you know, a significant p-value or whatever that means in our context, and then we update our tool and now it doesn't the result is no longer significant. Maybe that bug fix, maybe it was a bug fix that means we didn't have a real result before. Maybe it's just a processing choice that isn't necessarily a bug fix, but just a change, um, like a lateral move. And it's important to understand again, what those changes are and what impact they have on our, um, on our results. So as scientific users, it's really important to do things like regression testing. Um, cool. So then, um, just to go into the non-functional types of testing, and by the way, keep asking questions and Tristana Valerie, thank you for reading them to me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so um, to the, the non-functional types of testing, and I don't know if any of you have spoken to Valerie about her work, but it kind of falls a lot into the realm of trying to optimize for really high stress type workflows. Um, so stress testing is again, evaluating what is the you know, footprint of, um, of your, uh, your tool. So again, say you're working on a massive data set, you know, a terabyte large uh, image or, or something like that. Is there a way that you can process this in memory? Is there a way that you can understand how many resources are being used at a time, how long this is going to take and all this stuff. And, you know, as you guys have been um, slowly, I think, getting introduced to the concepts like high performance computing and using Compute Canada and all that. Um, it's very important to understand the stress of your tool because then you know how many resources to request. On, uh, on shared systems and you can be like a good computing citizen basically. Um, and then of course the last one is the most obvious, install testing, <laughs> making sure that you don't have conflicting versions of dependencies, making sure that, you know, if I need a really old version of NumPy because I really like the way that they implemented a function then, but I need a really new version of scikit-learn because they just implemented a new algorithm, if those are mutually exclusive or not, like if for instance scikit-learn requires a newer version of NumPy or whatever it is, um, install testing is a way just to resolve all of that and make sure that at any moment when you make changes, your tool can still be installed successfully. Um, so we are going to do some version of all of these. Um, it, granted, uh, we get through it all in time um, on this little kind of dummy project I made at the end. Um, but uh, again, keep firing off questions about testing in, in the chat before, uh, before we move on. But um, but so then the next question is really, you know, given that we know now to some extent what types of tests we want to run, you know, I want to test, you know, my scale stripping algorithm. I want to test my entire pipeline. You know, I want to see how changing my thresholds affects my result. Um, you know, how do we store these tests? So there's a bunch of like, there's a many different ways and it's, you know, in one, in one way, you know, we could store it as a, as a function. We can simply have, a function that calls our entire pipeline and there it's another module that basically calls our tests. We can have external scripts, we can have example workflows, we can have executable documentation. So there's many different ways you can write tests that will effectively do the same thing. 
and um, and this is an, also an interesting point, which begs that if we're writing functions and scripts and workflows for our tests, the point of having this slide is, then should we test our tests? And this, so there's a rabbit hole kind of that you can fall down. Um, and there's something that I won't probably get to today, um, but is worth looking into that's basically code coverage. And there's a bunch of different other tools like this, um, but pretty much what they, what they allow you to do is say, well, this test, you know, um, covered 100 lines of your module um, this, you know, this, in general, you are testing 85% of the lines of your code. Um, you know, each line is on average being tested five times or two times or, or whatever. Um, and so you can get like good summary statistics about how well your tests are actually, um, you know, spanning the, the library that you're working on. Um, and, uh, and by the way, in case anyone's really curious about this type of stuff, I've got the, on the last slide, um, and I'll post these in content if I haven't yet. I think I haven't yet. Um, but uh, I've posted examples on the last slide that um, showcase, you know, projects that have these types of integrations and testing suites and have like coverage reports. You can get a sense of different libraries that you can use to evaluate your tests themselves, um, you know, run them and, uh, and get a sense of, am I really doing a good job at evaluating my, um, my tools? And some of these are, of course, harder to, you know, there's a limit to this and that I can't necessarily have a good test that I'm able to say with certainty it's an effective regression test. Um, scientifically, again, like I wouldn't, it's, it's conceptually, we need then some theory about, oh, is it conceptually meaningful that, um, you know, my graph is now more sparse because I changed the threshold or something like that. So, of course, there's a limit to where this uh, reaches the bounds of like, this is now science and no longer like software development. Um, but in general, this will get you most of the way for, um, for practical purposes. So then I guess this all kind of begs the question that we've talked about a lot of different types of testing and lots of different ways we can encode, uh, encode them and then lots of ways that we have to even test them. So if we're supposed to do this every single time we change something, add a new function, whatever, will we ever have time to do something else? And that is essentially why continuous integration exists. So CI, continuous integration, I will jump back and forth between the names as well, everyone who talks about them. Um, so get used to seeing both. Um, but what uh, continuous integration essentially means is that if you have some repository, so we are, have all been you know, experts in Git at this point, um, and we know we store, store our code on GitHub. What we then do is we can integrate it to some platform that runs our tests for us. It'll again, potentially do our like analysis of our code or test coverage that I was talking about. And then it'll give us a report. And what that report will say is, you know, all of your tests passed and your code coverage, you're testing 100% of your code. And my goodness, your code is written to an A++ standard. Look at this amazing formatting, yada, yada, yada. Um, by the way, I've never once gotten a report even close to that good, so don't worry. Um, but, uh, but then it'll give you all these reports and you can really understand, okay, you know, what has changed from my last version to my new version, um, and then you can go forward with releasing it. So, um, so again, the nice thing here is it gives you a way to kind of have uh, an asynchronous feedback loop. You can develop some feature, you can push your changes up to GitHub, you can keep developing, and while you're working or working on a different project or something, um, at some point you'll get an email or a GitHub notification or however you set up your notification preferences um, to say, your tests are all done, come look at the report. And uh, it'll often say, you know, this feature broke or, or what have you. Um, and it allows you to, again, before ever releasing code, before ever sending it off to a user to say, um, oh, I wanna use my pipeline or, or even again, sending it to like a, a cluster yourself for am I gonna use this version of my tool in my, in my next paper? Um, you are you know, making sure that it's doing what you expect it to do and reducing the amount of time that you spend creating, running, finding a problem, debugging, fixing, then running, and you know, finding a new problem, debugging, fixing, running, because you know, resources are expensive. This is, the stress test is you know, meaningless if you have to run your code a thousand times. Um, so, uh, so really this is meant to have a tight feedback loop between the features you're developing and the, their evaluation. Um, does anyone have any questions about kind of this 
um, workflow. Maybe a brief one, so just to, um, to try to touch on um, scientific data testing. Yeah. So imagine you have some data here, like, like I mean, obviously if you're testing a pipeline, you, you would need some, some testing data. Uh, it's usually not good practice to put it in GitHub or in a Git repo. So yep. how do you do that? Where do you yeah, put the data? So that's a great question. So there's a bunch of solutions. So one that is very tightly coupled to GitHub um, is actually Git LFS. I don't know if anyone is familiar with that yet or has been introduced to it. Git LFS is Git large file storage. Um, GitHub has uh, by default um, some plan for this that allows you to like 100 megabytes of data on your free projects. Um, so that's one option. Another thing is you have know, platforms like Google Drive or Open Science Framework or really any public data repository. And then part of your configuration in your um, continuous integration suite, this is a tool called Travis that I'll show you in a, mom in a moment. Um, you can download your data and do whatever setup you need before testing your tool. So there's different like kind of what they call build stages. And so again, what you can do is say, okay, great. I, you know, my continuous integration, I'm going to get my new version of code. Great. Install it. Once it installs successfully, download the data that I want to test it with. Once the download is done, then run my tests. If my tests are done, say, say congratulations and, you know, give yourself a pat on the back. Um, so that you can set up these continuous integration suites to do all of this well, and you can even make st different steps to run in parallel. Um, so for instance, you could download your data in one step and then run three parallel jobs after that um, that are testing it differently, for example. Um, but yeah, that's a great question. Um, cool. So basically what we are going to do in terms of, or the way I'm going to, what I'm going to advocate for rather, uh, in terms of tool development for our projects, and I know a lot of you are kind of making different tools, um, is that uh, in general, the way I try and develop is by making the scaffolding of a project. So basically the broad strokes, I approximately am going to have a layout, something like this. I'm going to have these types of functions. They're going to be, you know, working together in this way. Um, and as soon as there's enough that it exists, I'm going to set up continuous integration immediately. And once we have continuous integration set up, every single time I add a new feature, I am going to write a test for that feature. And once my test is written for that feature, I can push that to CI as well, uh, alongside my code. They all live in the same project. Um, and then make sure that every new feature as I'm developing it is working as I expect it to. So at least I have unit tests for every single feature as I go. And then it's much easier at the end of the day to add an integration test. Um, and one thing, a phrase that you may have heard um, is a test-driven development. So if we went so far as to develop our tests before even developing our tools, um, that is what's called test-driven development. And this is a very common practice nowadays where, again, we simply say, you know, I have, say, a CSV file and I want to perform function X on that CSV file. Um, well, I'm going to, you know, create a template CSV file. I'm going to, um, you know, call this stub of an application or a function that doesn't exist yet. And then I'm going to compare the expected result to what actually that function is returning. And then that's kind of a way that you almost set the goalposts in terms of when you're done developing that feature. If you start by setting the test, if you start by saying, this is what is required to pass, then you can develop with that goalpost in mind. Um, so again, this is test-driven development. It's a, a great practice. I think it's harder to keep yourself accountable on than, than would be ideal. I think it's, um, I don't think I've ever been fully effective at actually doing that. I think in general, I get too excited about the features I'm developing, I develop them, and then I go write tests later. Um, and I think that that's probably not uncommon. So um, again, if you want to try and hold yourself to doing things like test-driven development, that would be wonderful, but just you know, know that it's not just you if you're failing to actually uh, follow through on that. It's a, it's a hard thing to do. Um, it's also the type of things that you can do uh, throughout the project. I mean, even if you didn't start with test-driven development, mm -hmm. at some point you could say, oh, you know, for 
the next three features I'm going to write this first Absolutely. and then if you give up on it, it's totally fine. Exactly. And right, there's no, um, you know, particular order these things need to be done in because at the end of the day, your code doesn't care when the test was written for it. It just needs to have a test. Um, so, uh, so that's basically the idea. Again, this is just one particular order in which you could do that. Um, so if anyone, I mean, we can, I'll pause in a second, but I'll first tell you what we're going to do. Um, but uh, if anyone has questions, can you feel free to start writing them. But basically what we're going to do is I created this kind of template repo um, that we'll go to in a second. We are going to um, set up continuous integration for this. We are going to have it install our tool and its dependencies. We're going to write like a little bash script to test our tool, make sure it runs. We're going to make sure continuous integration is running that test. Then we're going to add another one in Python and make sure it's running that test. And um, as far as we get, we'll be, you know, as far as we get. But, uh, but the idea is just, we'll show you a couple ways of how to set up CI using this platform. Um, and then a couple possible ways of writing tests. Because again, at the end of the day, a test doesn't need to be um, anything other than a way that you are simply, you know, running a piece of your code in a way that you are providing some inputs have an expected output. And again, we talk, what we talked about at, first, um, at the beginning rather, is that this can be as simple as making sure the tool doesn't crash in some cases. And this can be as complicated as expecting that a specific value in a specific row or cell of a data frame or image is the value you want it to be. Um, so this can be a huge gamut of things. And again, we'll try and write a couple of each category um, here. So does anyone have any questions before we get started on that? Um, oh, and uh, again, as I promised, I'll link these slides so everyone has, has the link to it. Um, but here are three different um, projects in, of different uh, complexities in terms of their Travis. Uh, Travis is the continuous integration tool I mentioned. Um, in terms of their configuration for continuous integration, um, Boutiques is a project of Tristan's and mine, and Fuzzy is a project also of ours, and Nylern you've all heard of. Um, and they all have very different setups in terms of how they use the Travis, um, con the continuous integration tools. I'd say that Boutiques is the simplest one um, in terms of how it's set up. Um, uh, Fuzzy has a lot of nice like parallelization and so does Nylearn, but they both set up their parallelization stuff very differently. Um, so these are just a few examples and there's so many more and there's even other tools. There's another tool called Circle CI and there's one called AppVayer and there's tons of them. So again, what uh, is important is I'm not trying to pigeonhole you to all use Travis. I think Travis is probably the lowest barrier to entry. It's the easiest CI to get started with. It's been around a while. Um, and uh, so that's why we're starting there. But this is really, the concept is the most important thing here. Don't ever worry about you know, memorizing Travis's syntax or things like that. Um, cool. So unless people have questions, um, we should get started. Let's see if that, uh, so you guys can still see my screen, right? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so, so this is the GitHub repository that I linked is where we'll start from. There's a little git ignore file, a Travis file, but there's actually nothing in it yet. Um, let's see the git ignore file. I picked just the Python one because my script happens to be Python. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, but when creating a, a repository, um, you can again pick like an, a default license. You can pick a default, you know, language for your tool and things like that. Um, inside uh, inside this um, code folder, we have a few things. We have test.py, which is currently empty. We have test.sh, which is currently empty. We have bestscienceever.py, which is our amazing tool that we're going to write tests for. Um, so the function of this tool. It is the coolest science ever. It splits a data frame. It will compute the mean on the column, or it will merge a few data frames with the same columns. It's outstanding. No, no cooler science exists on the face of the earth as far as I'm concerned. Um, of course, I'm kidding. Um, but uh, this is, I basically took this as an example of something that I needed to do recently. You may think, well, why is this a relevant thing? Um, so an example of justification for why a tool like this needs to exist or could exist 
is, so for instance, I have, you know, a few thousand um, graphs that I need to process. I need to compute a bunch of, you know, univariate and multivariate statistics on them. Some of those statistics take a long time to compute. If I were to do them all one after another um, for, you know, my thousands of graphs, it would take me about a year. Um, so what I do is I split my data frame into batches of 10, and then I have 400-ish data frames that are each 10 rows instead of 4,000, and then I run all of those in parallel, which takes much, much, much less time. And instead of waiting a year so I can continue my experiments, I'm waiting, you know, a few minutes. Um, so, uh, so that's just a bit of a justification as to why this super simple, seemingly useless tool has a scientific uh, need. So what we're going to do is with some, you know, test data set, which is just some CSV that I made up a few minutes ago, um, we are going to and, uh, and write some tests for it and set it up so that continuous integration continues to test it for us. So, um, and again, please continue to throughout this whole process be, you know, writing questions in the, uh, in the chat window. Let's see if now that I'm not in full screen, I can see the chat thing. I can't seem to. I can find participants, but can't seem to see the chat. Oh, there it is. There's behind the, I found it, Never mind. I just don't know how to make computers work. Um, cool. So uh, what we're going to do is go to Travis. TravisCI.org. So Travis, as I mentioned, is this great continuous integration tool. And I happen to be logged in, so it's already telling you about some projects. Apparently, it brought you to my one called Fuzzy. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go Greg, to some, some Isabel is asking if the link to the notebook is shared. A uh, notebook. Um, I guess the GitHub repo. Uh, sure. Uh, oh, right, of course, the repo. I'll just post it in content right now um, and here. But uh, the, it's in the slides as well. Um, Thanks. Yeah, no worries, uh, Isabel. And then I'll also just quickly grab the link for the slides and share those in content too, in case anyone wants to, you know, check up on them while we're going through this. Um, cool. Sweet. Thanks for um, thanks for asking, Isabel. Well. So, um, so what I'm going to do? So I mentioned that I went to um, that I went to TravisCI.org. Uh, then I went to basically my little settings thing on the right. If you haven't logged in, you may need to log in. If you log in with GitHub, it'll automatically recognize different um, projects that you have. So then it shows a bunch of my repositories here. Um, so you can see and where the check mark is on, some of those have continuous integration already set up and some don't. Um, but you can actually, instead of scrolling through them, just search. So I think I called this intro to testing. Hmm, but it doesn't seem to exist. Repositories, sync account, maybe I should do that. Syncing from GitHub. So I just press this again, this little button on the left, in case people can't see my mouse. It seems that maybe it didn't automatically recognize my repo. And again, part of the reason why I'm going through this and I didn't have it you know, already set up is just so you guys can understand that the process is, while it may be intimidating if you've never gone through it, it isn't particularly complicated. It's just a matter of finding you know, the right buttons. Um, so uh, I think it's more valuable for you to see how I struggle and solve the problems than to just um, see something magically finished in front of you and <laughs> be expected to get there. Um, so uh, let's see, syncing is taking a while. Maybe I'll refresh the page and break it. Let's see if it wants to show up now. Intro doesn't want to show up. That's fun. Okay. So try to sync again. I've had similar issues uh, recently. Yeah. Yeah. You could also go to the .com version. So Travis CI, one thing that I'll note while this is happening is, so there's travisci.org, which is like the free version. And then travisci.com is the um, like corporate version. They have some more features. They have better support for things that are like private projects. Um, 
it's basically the same service, just plus plus. And uh, sometimes, again, depending on the nature of your projects, if you can, like, if you have a private repository you'd like to test, you need to use the .com one. Um, so it might just be, uh, again, kind of bugging for some reason. Maybe they're, I don't know, making an update. Who knows? Um, how did you resolve the issues in the past, uh, Tristan, with it not syncing quickly? Just waiting. Just waiting. Cool. Yeah. Um, sweet. So then I guess we'll go while we're doing that, we'll start thinking about testing. So I'll leave this tab open and I'll go to my terminal. So this is just a cloned version of my repository. Um, you know, it has all the files there that I mentioned. Um, so what we're going to do is oh, actually, I didn't mean to have an environment folder inside there. So what we're going to do is uh, go and look at our code or our, uh, our tool. Well, actually, before running our tool, one thing that um, I know you guys have been introduced to, uh, well, both with Tristan yesterday from the perspective of containers, but uh, I believe earlier with introduction to Python, is virtual environments. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an environment. I'm going to use a tool called virtual env, make a Python 3 environment, put it inside my env folder, and call this um, Intro to testing seems like a reasonable name for my environment. And that way, any tool that I need to install for this project will be in this one little spot that's isolated from the rest of my Python installations. And that way, if I have versions that are conflicting with one another or, or other things like that, um, this is isolated from all of that. So I'm going to enter environment. And now we see this little red text bit on the, on the side here. Um, cool. So now I'm going to do just make sure, you know, I am using indeed Python three. Yep. Great. So I'm going to go inside my code folder. Again, this is where our best science ever Python script is best science ever.py. And I'm going to run it and say, uh Oh, there's no module named pandas. So let's install pandas. I'm sure I'll get an error again, unless this installs another dependency. Because I also need NumPy, I remember. We'll see if Pandas, oh, there we go. Pandas is installing NumPy for us. So we'll sh we should be fine now. OK. So now that we've done this, I mean, one thing we talked about was installation testing. So. Installation testing, you know, of course, is making sure that our tool can be run. So let's see a way to get a sense of if our um, if our or what dependencies our tool needs is I'm not sure if you guys have been introduced to the pip freeze command before, but what this shows you is everything that's installed in your current Python environment, the versions of them, and and so on. So in this case, you know, we don't really care about the version of date util. PyTZ or six, these are all just dependencies of pandas. We'll let pandas resolve its own dependencies. But what we know is that we need, or that it, our tool works, or well, ostensibly should work with a version of NumPy that's this and a version of pandas that this, that's this. And those two should hopefully be compatible with one another. Because, well, that version of pandas installed that version of NumPy. Um, so what we can do now is try our tool again, see best science ever, let's see what happens. Taken a while. Aha, error. The, follow, the following arguments are required. So I'm just going to you know, print a bit of help text to make our lives a little easier. So there's a few modes here. So again, as I mentioned, we can either split our data frames, we can process them, which literally means taking the mean, um, or we can concatenate them back together. And if we're splitting them, we have this optional extra argument that is how many rows we want per data frame. Sweet. So what I'm going to do is say, Python, best science ever. We want to do a split now because we have a single data frame. And let's just see what happens if we put in testdata.csv. OK, what happened? So let's, we're going to look at two things here. We're going to look at, uh, do, do, we're going to look at both our data frames. OK, so first of all, I didn't provide a, an argument for, um, one sec, I'm just opening a second terminal there. Cool. Um, so we didn't provide an argument for, um, for the number of rows. So let's see, again, what was our default 
um, for the number of rows. Let's see if we, our help text will show that for us. Oh, it doesn't. Okay, so maybe we need to look inside our file. The default number of rows is 10. It's evidenced by this chunk. So what we did here, we have a data frame that appears to be, you know, nine lines long. We split it and well, it didn't actually do anything useful because our entire data set is, you know, in here. And it also didn't give us the same um, data frame out because as I'm just flicking back between these, as you notice, there's an extra column here on our left. So if we just had written a test that says, okay, test the, the tool runs, you know, to completion, we could just say, you know, in our, in our little bash test, whoops, um, there we go. In our little test.sh, uh, we could literally just copy paste uh, this line. Uh, and technically our tool would pass this test, but would everyone agree that our tool is doing exactly what we want in this case? I mean, I, I feel like that's the type of rhetorical question that works better in a live audience, <laughs> but, uh, but I think we could all say no. Um, so, so, so far, this test is passing, but we agree that we aren't exactly getting what we want. So let's think of a better test today. Is, um, we know that based on the way our tool is currently written, the output of our, uh, of our uh, command when run like this will be a new CSV file that looks like that. Maybe what we can do is look at the difference between those two, right? So we can say, you know, in a perfect world, um, in a perfect world, splitting with 10 rows greater than our uh, original data frame, the input and output would be identical. And I think, does everyone agree on that, hopefully? Yeah, again, this is the type of rhetorical question that is better in a live audience because I can see heads nodding. Um, <laughs> apologies. So, um, so what I'm going to do is then, you know, try and run the same test. And then basically what I'm going to do is ask test diff um, testdata.csv and the test data process version.csv. Although do I, I actually don't need to rerun this because I'm just running the same thing. So I can actually run kind of two tests for the price of one execution. So I'm just going to do this. So now let's try and run this little test script. So I'm just going to make it executable. Oh, whoops. Uh, there we go. And I'm going to write test.sh. Aha. So this is not nothing. One thing that, uh, you know, one thing that this test was able to show us is that while our tool ran successfully, it wasn't, you know, giving us the result we wanted. So um, does anyone notice something funny about my terminal between this line right here and this line right here that's different about them? I'll press enter once so you can see them more clearly. You can again type this or say this, it doesn't matter. There's a subtle difference between my, the way I've got my prompt set up here, my prompts out there. Yep, the color of the dollar sign. So, Basically, um, ha have you guys uh, been introduced to exit codes yet? Uh, again, uh, any yes or no in the, okay, perfect. So every time a command in Linux or pretty well every system I think runs, um, at its termination, there will be some status. It will basically say, yes, I ran properly, don't worry about it. Or it'll say, no, I didn't run properly. Um, and this is uh, conveyed through the exit code. So what I'm actually first gonna do is I'm going to comment out this line and we're going to just run this test. So I'm gonna do this again. It ran our test. 
Voila. So in this case, the um, dollar sign stayed purple. Um, the way I just happened to have my uh, computer set up is that if the previous command errored, it gave an exit code that wasn't the one that everyone agrees is everything ran fine, which is the number zero. Um, it will make the do uh, dollar sign a different color for me, just so that I notice that something failed. So what we're actually going to do is make our testing a little bit smarter, and we're going to have our script recognize that for us. So here, let's see, how do we do that? Bash, look, look at, uh, my keyboard is lagging, look at error code. Well, actually, I actually don't want to say look at. Um, if error code is not zero. Cool. So again, as I mentioned, there's always an error code. The universal value for everything's okay is to return zero. Um, so let's see, check the exit status using an if statement. If dollar sign question mark is do, 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 equal to one. So what I can say is test if this is equal to zero, otherwise something happened. This seems fine. Um, so again, this is, I'm deliberately doing this on Stack Overflow and live in front of you guys so that you don't think there's any magic here. Um, this is just like some idiosyncrasies of, you know, bash. There's many different ways we can do this. Um, if you don't know the syntax, that's fine. It's just a matter of knowing how to learn it. Um, so if this is, so what I'm actually going to do is copy the other command. Whoops, wrong bracket. Um, then I'm going to do that. And then, and again, I'll leave this as just uh, this is in case uh, anyone else wants to reference it later. And I'm also going to paste the link just again so people, I'm going to push all these changes as I do them, um, just so that anybody can see uh, what happened or how we got there before. So now let's test this out. I'm going to do this here. Test passed, woohoo. So now what I could probably do is something like, uh, test failed as well. And now I'm going to just make this a garbage command by adding a bunch of garbage characters. We know that that spelling of split is not valid. Um, and voila, it ran some stuff, it printed some things to the terminal and we got told the test failed. Cool. So uh, let's see. All right. So here we're now writing a test where we're running something on this line here, line five. And then we are saying, well, based on the exit status of this, did it pass or did it fail? Um, so now again, we can uh, color in this test again. We can, you know, there's, of course, more efficient ways to do this, but we can just put our little um, pass fail check there. And we can see about both our tests. Of course, this can be more descriptive um, with, uh, you know, putting like test one passed, test two failed, and so on and so forth. But what we see is our first thing passed, our second one failed, because the things are not the same. But this is probably pretty annoying in that we're seeing a bunch of things printed to our screen that we don't necessarily want. What if we just never want to see the output of these, uh, of the, the commands? We just want to know if they passed or failed. We don't necessarily care how they passed or failed yet. We just want to know the, the uh, report. So what I'm basically doing here is, um, whoops, uh, actually, that's fine. Um, what, what I'm basically saying here is take all of your, um, your outputs basically that are either the, you know, normal printed outputs or the error messages and just throw them away, put them in this container called dev null, which your system has, um, which basically says, don't print them to the screen anymore. Um, and voila, now what we're, we're doing is we're, you know, running two tests. We're saying that it did successfully execute but the result was not exactly what we wanted. Let's quickly go back and check if Travis has finished syncing. My goodness. I'm going to try travisci.com. Uh, uh, 
Um, I don't know if there's a dash in that one. Okay, there is, but they did it for me. Sign in with GitHub. Apparently I don't use this version often. Um, too many organizations. Oh, well, I don't want to give you guys my password. I mean, I like you, but. Okay, cool. All right, so many more projects. Let's see if this one wants to work for me. So again, going to settings. Um, I want to uh, sync. I want to activate um, all repositories, only select. I don't need that many repositories. I just need this one for the sake of teaching right now. Okay, approve and install. Let's see if this wants to work for us. Okay, cool. Travis is doing something. We have, I'm going to ignore the person trying to talk to me. Awesome. So what I just did very quickly was pretty much allowing um, Travis to have access to my account. I just, again, went to the pro version because I have a GitHub education account, um, which again, I think Sam was mentioning to you earlier in the week that it's a great way to get free access to a lot of things you normally have to pay for. Um, but it seems like this version uh, was allowing me to, to, um, to set things up. So here I gave it permission and now it recognizes that my repository exists, but it says the build is unknown. So what I think we'd like to do is now that we've, you know, written a test, we would probably like to try and install our um, installer tool and run this test on, uh, on uh, Travis. So let's see, cool. I'm going to, I don't need to add the test data file, but I'm going to just commit my test.sh added to tests. Um, runs successfully and files match. You know, that name isn't perfect, but it exists. Um, cool. So let's see, build unknown. Well, I guess what's the next step? I suppose how to set up Travis to build my repository. Set up Travis, look at that. The first hit on Google. Let's hope it's not just because, you know, I. Google things like this all the time. I suspect that would be uh, something that you guys would get as well. So again, the getting started guide is pretty simple. And uh, again, I can't stress enough. The reason why I'm going through it this way is to simply illustrate that it's not about memorizing syntax. It's about just understanding the workflow. Um, so what I'm first going to do is we have a Travis.yml already. I had that in the base directory of my repository. And inside of it, we want to say language. Well, in this case, we're Python, um, so I'm going to ignore them there. And then it says RVM uh, 2.2 and, and uh, JRuby. I think what I'm going to do instead is Python and say 3.7.3, because that's the version I have on my, um, on my local computer from when we typed uh, Python dash dash version. So I'm going to just save my file. And now I need to commit it. Um, GC, by the way, is just shorthand for git commit, if in case you see me typing that um, on my computer. So then uh, git commit Travis YML um, added stub for Travis file. And then GPH is git push for, again, it's just an alias that I set up. These aren't actual git commands. Um, it's just uh, things that I've set up so that I don't have to type as much because I'm a very lazy person. Um, if I would recommend doing the same thing if you also find yourself using Git a lot because it, if you only have to type three characters instead of seven and you do this a thousand times a day, it adds up. Um, <laughs> but that's the tangent. Uh, so anyways, we can go back to our repository and oh, look what's happening on the left here. It is building something. It has been running for 18 seconds. And as soon as I created my little configuration file, again, the Travis that I just wrote, it recognized that it's going to build a Linux operating system using Xeniel, which I think is 18.04 um, version of Ubuntu. Uh, then 
you know, Python with this language Python and versions 3.7.3. So it's basically what I said. It interpreted it correctly. It is da, 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 da. could not install requirements. Okay, so it failed. Why did it fail? It installed Python fine, and now it says could not install requirements.txt. Override the install key in your Travis to install dependencies, or just um, you know provide a requirements file. So remember the thing that I mentioned earlier. This is again just part of the configuration process. We did pip freeze. Pip freeze shows us the uh, things that are installed. We know that all of this was enough to run our tool. Um, so what I'm actually going to do is just take the uh, these tools and put them into a requirements.txt file. And as I said, I actually don't really care about these ones. These aren't really things that we necessarily need. They'll be installed anyways with uh, NumPy and Pandas, but the important thing is we want to keep this file as small as possible because that way it prevents possible version conflicts. So here we know that we need NumPy and we know that we need Pandas and we know that it needs it, you know, we know that it works with these versions, but maybe we'll be a little more generous and we'll say greater than or equal to these instead of exactly these versions. So then that way, if there's a new update, it can grab a newer version. So then what I'm going to do, GST again in my world is git status. I'm going to do git add requirements, git commit requirements, added requirements file. Um, again, I'll, I'll try and remember to type the long versions to make it more clear. Now I'm pushing. I realize I'm already over time, so I'll um, try and speed along in the next step. But uh, let's see. So now I've pushed my changes. I'm going to click on this thing again and see when it updates. Just going to keep refreshing the page obsessively. Don't mind me. There we go. Um, so the nice thing that you've noticed here is that I'm pushing my code to GitHub. You know, nothing has changed. I can refresh this project and it'll say, you know, commit added 36 seconds ago. Oh, so close, 41 seconds ago. Um, and, uh, and then what Travis is doing is it recognizes, oh, the code changed on GitHub. I'm going to try to start building things again. Um, so that's exactly what happens. It, again, and it's, it's uh, an environment with Python. It'll grab the requirements file that we created. It'll install things and voila, it failed again. Oh, why is it failing now? Now what it's saying is, please override the script key to run tests. Cool, so we may be installing something, but we aren't actually testing anything yet. So what we're going to do now is edit our Travis and it do exactly what it says. It said override the script key to add to run tests. So I'm going to have that be my thing. Or my um, excuse me. My uh, a command is just going to be to run this test. So the test was in the code folder, and I think it was test.sh. I'll just verify that that's the case by. Oh yeah, it is. It's right here. From you can see it in my bottom terminal. Um, Cool. Does it so have then, execution permissions, though? Uh, I believe it does because I changed it locally and then I recommitted since. Okay. But I'll do an ls alh, and we yeah. can indeed see that it has execution permissions. So again, remember, I'm not sure if you guys were taught much about permissions yet, um, but uh, there are three levels. There's read, write, and execute. And there's also three um, kind of people that these apply to. They can apply to the owner of the file, they can apply to people who are in the group that owns the file, and they can apply to everyone else. Um, and so when I did chmod plus x, as some of you may have noticed earlier, what I was just saying is add the executable permission across the board to, um, to this file. And so when I committed the file after that, it kept the permissions. So now I'm going to do this. Um, OK. And uh, let's see, git status, git commit, Travis, added test. And push. As you can probably already see, it's much faster for me to type GPH than git space push every time. Um, but uh, yeah, when my internet decides to work, it'll work. Um, but hopefully what you guys are getting a sense of, at this point, we will see that the script will run. Again, once this updates, um, 
and uh, and then we can continue to iterate on this process. You know, we can test more functions of our code. We can test, um, you know, do a better job at comparing things. We can make changes to our script so that the tests all pass. Um, and then one thing that you've no doubt seen on projects is we get this cool little badge. And you can include this in your project so that you and all of your users will know um, the state of your of your project, both in terms of is it building successful, you can get other badges in terms of how much of your code you're testing and things like that. Um, but it's just a nice way to have like a visual reminder of the state of your project. Um, so again, once this finishes, uh, there's one other point before I let you go that I want to, um, that I expect we'll run into that I want to mention, but then we're pretty much there. So, um, oh, so David asked a question. I can see them now. Um, yeah, so David asked the question, basically, should we use pip and virtual env instead of conda and standalone scripts instead of notebooks if we're using, uh, if we're using um, Travis? And what I would say is that, um, and I'll focus back on what happened here in a second, um, but uh, what I would say is that in general, and this is an important point with notebooks um, that uh, I'm not sure if <laughs> what you've been told to date, but I have strong feelings about notebooks and their correct use case. And what I would say is that um, if you are making something that is to be reused in the sense of like a script applied on new data, um, a Jupyter notebook may not be the right tool for that. A Jupyter notebook is a wonderful interactive environment, um, but as again, you may have been introduced to when notebooks were presented to you, um, is that it really is wrapping something called interactive Python, IPython, which means that really a Jupyter notebook is, is a shell. It is a terminal that you're working in with Python and it just happens to keep memory and embed figures for you so it's pretty and nice to look at. But it is not actually a packaging environment. Um, so if you're trying to make a pipeline, an end-to-end -end pipeline that you run and reuse and distribute, a Jupyter notebook is almost never the correct tool for that. Um, and you, what, uh, what you want to do is work in scripts. And that doesn't mean you can't then import things you wrote in your scripts into your notebooks and use them again there and things like that. And um, Valerie is going to be talking about packaging uh, tomorrow. So you can see a bit of how you create these scripts and packages so that they can be imported, again, either in a notebook or in any other script. Um, but the correct thing to do if you're making, say, like a pipeline or an analysis workflow um, may not be a Jupyter notebook. And it's worth, if you're on the fence at all, it's worth asking um, TAs in this class and instructors to, to give their opinion. Um, for my own personal use, the only time I, the only two times actually I use notebooks at all is one for teaching because it gives you a pretty web interface so I can use the browser. Um, and two, if I'm making figures. And the reason for making figures is because that's a thing that I would typically do in like a terminal anyways. And this way I get my figures in line with my code. Um, everything else uh, I do in scripts. And again, for the main reason being that I can package it, I can distribute them, I can reuse them more easily um, and so on. So uh, yeah, so thank you for the question, David. That was very timely. Um, and I have noticed that you know, a lot of people are using notebooks. So just remember that they are a wonderful tool, but just not for every application. Maybe to complement that, it's, um, it's also possible to actually write a Python library that is called from your notebook. So if your analysis becomes too substantial, let's say you start having you know, a few hundred lines of code, then you, know, you can also write them in a Python package independently from the notebook and then just call these functions from the notebook. And these functions can then be tested on Travis if need be, independently from the notebook. Because it's true that testing things interactively is going to be difficult. Right, exactly. So, um, and again, what Valerie will teach you about packaging tomorrow and that'll make it much more clear how to do all of these pieces and work with them together. Um, but yeah, in general, I will say for everything you're doing that you want to be reusable at all, um, avoid notebooks when, uh, when possible. Oh, it seems Shima oh, just I think, copy-pasted the question and content. Um, cool. So the last thing that I just want to touch base on here before letting you guys go, again, sorry for keeping you, um, is we see two, th two strange things happen here. One, we saw that both our tests were failing now. And two, 
we saw that our build succeeded. <laughs> so this seems a bit confusing. So I, I'll just rather than again, since I know we're short on time, rather than asking you guys to debug with me and figure it out, I'll, I'll explain why both of those happened. So again, if we look at our Travis configuration, what we said was run code.test. Or sorry, in the code folder, the test.sh, sorry. So I'm going to go inside this folder and see what's happening in it. So again, I look in test.sh. And it's working, it's running our or it's running our script with the mode split and all this thing stuff. Well, we haven't provided any um, you know, any path to our data yet. So we haven't actually um, we're assuming that in the same directory as we're currently in, we have best signs ever.py, and we're assuming that in the same directory we also have test data at csv.py. Or sorry, dot csv. I can't speak anymore. Um, so what we actually need to do in our Travis script is first, in order for our, um, it's in the wrong directory, uh, what we first need to do for our Travis script is move to the correct location so that our test will actually work. And then I just need to do that. So the first thing is this will solve the first problem of making both our tests maybe not fail anymore. Now, the second problem is that even when our tests failed, it looks like they passed because our script, our test that, or our, our script that's running our tests, didn't exit with an error code that wasn't zero. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're basically going to say, um, I'm going to say e ec equals zero, and every time that I get to one of these branches that uh, where a test fails, I'm just going to add ec equals one, and then I'm going to say exit and I'm going to call that exit with the code here. So basically I will by default say that my tests are passing by setting this line three up here. My error code, my exit code is gonna be zero. And every time I fail, I just make sure that it's at least set to one um, then. And then we're gonna exit with that code so that we're, you know, if we're actually failing, we're, we're gonna communicate that properly. Um, so I'm going to just, uh, fixed bug in how we called our tests. And then that should solve both of our, our problems there. Um, so while we're waiting, I guess we can field some remaining questions and then, um, and then you guys can, can uh, hop offline and start packing. So uh, are there any uh, other questions so far? Again, feel free to unmute if you're more comfortable speaking than typing to uh, whatever works for you guys. Maybe just to comment while people are maybe typing their questions. So typically the, the setup of, of continuous integration, the Travis setup in this case is a one-time thing. So you would, you would typically set it up, you know, at the beginning of your project and then maybe add tests, but the whole setup is, uh, is done already and, and often copy paste it across projects too, because what's important are tests, not really this setup. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, you know, and there's some examples that, uh, that I mentioned actually, I'll show you. Um, where you can do really complicated things and have like parallel flows and stuff like that. So if we look at this project that's, uh, that I mentioned earlier, you know, I have this project where I need to build something. And then once it works, I can build other things upon it. And once those work, I can build other things upon them. And then once that works, I can build other things upon. Them. Um, so here we have a bunch of different build stages that are, these ones can be parallel, but then the, you know, base to environments one to environments two and applications, those are all having to be sequential. So you can do lots of fancy configurations that allow you to do all this stuff. So there's tons of, you know, messy logic that if you again, haven't seen this before is totally intimidating, um, but allows you to really make these complicated workflows that really let you test things very efficiently rather than me on my computer having to, you know, build all these things, which as you see in some co cases takes like 25 minutes. Um, it'll run all of this for me so that in about, you know, cumulatively the one minute plus 25 plus 25 plus seven, um, I, I'm able to get all my, my tasks completed. And again, that's without any of my own um, time wasted on it. Um, cool, so now if we go back to our testing script, the one I was mentioning, now we have exactly what we expected. We move into the right directory, 
that succeeded. That's good to know. And then we run our test script and the first test passed, the second test failed. And that means that we left our script with the exit code one, meaning we still have a test to fix or um, you know, a bug to fix rather. So this is a very basic type of workflow. Um, I haven't even gotten to gotten close to talking about you know um, testing and specifically with Python using a tool called PyTest. But again, we can. These are all things that we can sync up on um, offline if everyone, if anyone is interested. Um, testing is a massive topic. So is continuous integration. Um, so this was just meant more to be like a primer on the way to approach it um, than anything else. And of course, this has all been published to the GitHub repo. Um, that uh, that I you know uh, linked in the slides and in content, um, so you can see exactly what the Travis setup currently is, what the testing script is, what the script itself is, um, and all that stuff. Um, so you can see what we did. Thank you very much, Greg. That was great. Uh, a lot of things in there, concrete things. That's that's uh, very good and I guess very useful too. Um, unless there is any other question, then that's the end of the talk this morning. Um, I guess we can stop recording too. Yep. <laughs>